to uh, reach for a Bible in the pew if you don't have one, or reach for your own, and I'm going to ask you to open up to a passage, Song of Solomon. Now, I've been a pastor since uh, I, was, I graduated college in 1983. I sold in the construction industry. I sold plastics. I became a pastor in 1990. I'm guessing I've preached about 3,500 sermons since then, uh, Sunday mornings, nights, Wednesday evenings. I've never asked anybody to open up to Song of Solomon. And you'll you understand why as we move along a little bit in here. But I've never preached a sermon in Song of Solomon. But if you can't find it, it's after the Psalms. And uh, I'll be reading the passage for us uh, there in Song of Solomon, actually, um, chapter 7 when I get to it. Sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, yo, i got to tell you something wild that happened this week. And they'll kind of share how I was just feeling sad or I was feeling, I was in doubt, I was hurting, I was feeling far from God, I was, I was confused and I kind of said, Lord, I'm crying out to you. Like we sang, it is the cry of my heart, I'm crying out to you, God. Are you even there? And you know what I did? I took my Bible and I just opened it and let it fall open to whatever page. And then I didn't look and I pointed. And I looked down where my finger was and I was pointing at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7 where God says, I have seen the affliction of my people and I've heard your cry. Pastor, isn't that amazing? And I'll say, yes. Wow. You know, that you were like, God, I need you. Are you there? And you open your Bible and you did one of those pointing What's it say? And I'll say, we do have an amazing God. We have a God who works in real time. He really does. He really does transcend into our lives. And it's exciting. But I would also say that that's not a good routine to have to hear from God. And we'll give you an example. In Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 7 Imagine if I was saying, Lord, I give you my life. You tell me what you want me to do. Just tell me. I let the Bible fall open, point on the page, and I happen to be pointing at Song of Solomon chapter 7 and verse 2. And I read from God, your navel is like a round goblet. And I say, Lord, what are you telling me? Because my navel, I don't think of it as a goblet. My belly button is not goblet. Are you telling me you want me to have surgery done so that I will have a biblical belly button? Is there such a thing as a biblical belly button? Some of you, the fact that I'm even saying the word belly button, you're like, oh, man. He already went too far, right? I hope that illustration kind of gives you an answer that the open point look and apply is not a good approach to studying Scripture. But it may also lead you to a question that's fair. What in the world is that verse doing in the Bible? (laughs) There are some people who have read the book of Song of Solomon and have said, what is that book doing in the Bible? That, have you ever read it? That book doesn't belong in the Bible. And yet it is. And today we're going to begin a series. Now it will not be a verse by verse series, and I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But we're going to begin a series looking at reflections out of Scripture from the Song of Solomon, things that it points us to, principles to draw out of it. There's a verse of Scripture that Paul writes to Timothy, and we know it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says what? All Scripture is inspired. It's all God-breathed. It doesn't mean that the Apostle Paul sat there and went, I can't, my pen, I can't control it. Look, it's... I can't, it's it, no. Paul was writing what was on his mind, but we absolutely believe that human being, the Apostle Paul, who was capable of sin, who did sin, 
When he was writing that, we believe that God literally was inspiring him, breathing the words as he wrote them out, right? All Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, Paul tells Timothy, so that we could be equipped, we could be the people of God that he wants us to be. There's a good principle there because our primary role is not telling the people who don't believe in God how they should live. If you don't believe in the Bible, I don't expect you to seek to live by the Bible. But I say I do believe in the Bible. So I would hope that you would expect me to seek by the grace of God to listen to it and live by it. Well, when we read 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is inspired, it's profitable. We're like, yes, Scripture, give me it. And then we open up to Song of Solomon chapter 1 and verse 1. And we read the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. May he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. And you go, huh? Where are we going? Maybe some of you are like, hold, get, I, you need to hold her ears. So put the earphones on now. You're allowed to have your earphones on in church. Or are we not going to bring the kids in the next few weeks? Or, no, don't. Don't run ahead of where we are. But what we do realize is when we read those verses, we're not reading Jeremiah's prophecy. We're not reading Paul writing to the Romans. We think about the beginning of a gospel. The Apostle Matthew says, the gospel, the genealogy of Jesus, and so and so begat, so and so begat, so and so. And That sounds like scripture. We open up here and we read, May he kiss me, and it's Solomon's bride, we'll get to see that, shouting that out. May he kiss me. And it doesn't sound like Scripture. It sounds like a movie scene, right? It sounds not like Matthew, it sounds more like Buddy the Elf, as he enters the room and says, what? I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. And he throws his hat, and whoo! We were thinking, where is this fitting in with what we're used to? Some of you may read those opening verses and read, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Oh, I'm going to love this study. And others of you may hear it and go, you're more like the father of Buddy the Elf in the business meeting, kind of saying, yeah, that's that's great, buddy. That's that's great. We're, We're involved in some real life stuff over here. Some of you may feel like, yes, romance. Others may feel like, oh, that's for the romantic people. But by God's grace, I believe we're going to be able to see 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 in our study. This is not going to be a study in romance. In some ways it will, and in the romance of our life with God as well. But this is going to be a study of reflections that I truly believe that that for every one of us, no matter where you are in life, that we are going to find that there is a life lesson for us here. And so we're not going to be going verse by verse, but we will begin with 1 Solomon 1, verse 1, and we see this, the Song of Songs. And the first thing I want us to recognize when we study this book is, remember, this is a song. This is poetic language set to music. This is Solomon writing a song. And in it, he writes words that his bride sings to him. He sings to her. There's other people singing to them. It's a whole production. It's not an apostolic letter. It's not a gospel. It's not a prophecy. It's not a law book, but it is the inspired Word of God. It's a song that was probably part of their marriage celebration, so we have to kind of take our cultural context and and embrace theirs. And their, their weddings were like seven days long of a celebration. Seven days, and this was probably a song that was sung throughout. We go to weddings and... Nowadays, right, you know, you get to the reception, and at the reception, they introduce into, and ladies and gentlemen, now our married couple of the day, uh, 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 
uh, uh, uh, uh, and they come walking in and doing whatever, and you know, and it's it's different than when I got married. When I got married, they were like, ladies and gentlemen, Vince and Greta McDonald, and we just kind of walked in together, and everybody clapped, and we went to our seat, right? But when we did, there was a string quartet there, and we had heard them over in Philadelphia, and we liked their playing, but we didn't like their singing. And so we had hired them just to go around the reception playing. A lot of aunts and uncles, you know, play songs, whatever that people would like. And we got seated, and they walk out into the front, right, right in front of the, the, the main table, and you hear them playing, and it's a build-up. And I'm thinking, this build-up sounds like there's going to be song. And it builds, da, 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 and the guy goes, love is a many splendid thing. And my brother Tom's next to me as my best man going, do you want me to tell him to shut up? Do you want me to tell him to stop singing? You know. <laughs> but it's a song, it's a celebration. And it's important for us to know that when we begin this study. It's a song. And in this song, we're going to read words where... Solomon talks to us about myrrh and frankincense, and he wants us to smell it. He talks to us about apples and pomegranates, and he wants us to taste them as he's using them for a description. He talks to us about polished ivory, and he wants us to touch it. He talks to us about flowing streams, and he wants us to hear those flowing streams. He talks to us about gazelles leaping over mountains, and he wants us to be captured by the sight of that. And in that sense, the Song of Solomon will emphasize and affirm to us the Song of Creation. Right? Because what was in the Song of Creation? It was the Creator God saying, I'm going to splash color for you to see and, smell, and, and you know, different scents for you to smell and things to taste. And I want you to hear stuff. And I want you to feel it, It's Why? Because God puts it all in there to remind us that life that he is creating, the human life that he's creating, is meant to be felt, to be experienced. Human life is not just meant to be timed and endured. It's meant to be lived, celebrated, reflected on, invested in. Take, for example, chapter 4 of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 9. What do we read there in Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 9? We read him saying, You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes. You may read that and your first thoughts may be, you know, Romance. And I read that, and I can remember when Greta and I were in the beginning of our dating stage, right? Just beginning to date, and, and uh, I, I was, you know, I was full blazing ahead. She was like, me, you know, and, 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 and but, you know, I, and I went to see her. It was, I had graduated college. I was working as an admissions counselor in recruitment, and she was in the summer working at Camp Sankinac, if anybody went there out in your Pottstown area. And I can remember driving out to see her. Oh, can't wait to see her. How's she going to feel when she sees me? And, and I remember pulling up, and she was sitting on a step. And when she saw me, she did. She kind of went and lit up. And it was like, ooh, you better believe my heart beat faster. Whoa. She looked happy. It was a lot better than her. Kind of, uh, you know, kind of like it was exciting. But that's not the only time that's happened in my life. I can remember as a little kid, it's not a clear memory, but I remember a, a blurry memory. I, I'm lost at a Knights of Columbus picnic out there on Fork Landing Road, and, 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 I, and, I'm, and I'm looking around, and, I, and, and through my tears, I'm not recognizing anybody. <sighs> Somebody comes along and says, you look like Leo McDonald's son, and they took me, and I remember seeing my dad, and my heart beat faster, because that's the guy I live with. That's my father. I can remember some years ago when Deanna was in eighth grade and I was coaching her soccer team. And she was my, you know, sweeper. She was, you know, and I was proud of her. And, I'm, and she's out there on the field and she's, you know, as one of the captains kind of leading practice. And, and my youngest daughter, Natalie, it got out of school and, and she went to school at the field and she's bouncing over to practice because she would just do her homework there in the stands, with, you know, doing practice. And I remember seeing her coming and Deanna there. And man, my heart was... These are the girls I invest in. My heart beat faster. 
I stand up here this morning and I look at you. Honest to goodness, my heart beats faster. We're tasting life together. I love seeing you giving up your time on a Sunday morning to say, we believe in God. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We care about what He wants to do in our lives. You look at Song of Solomon chapter 4 and verse 15. He says, you are a garden spring, a well of fresh water. And it makes me think about the Apostle Paul. Several times in the New Testament he said to somebody, you have refreshed me. You have refreshed me. You have refreshed me. You have added a freshness and a zip to my step. Has life become drab to you? Has it gotten dull? Tasteless? Maybe as we walk through some of the principles of Song of Solomon, the God who gave us this song is going to say to you, remember, you belong to a God who put songs in the Bible because He wants you to sing. Oh, I know some people sing in the shower and some people don't. I'm not talking about that. I mean, have a song in your heart. And so first we have to remember this is a song. It is a song. There's a second thing to remember about this, though, and it's this. It's a song about human love. It is a song about human love. Initially here, certainly, when we look at verse 2 and we, when we, as soon as we read it, right out of the gates, right? You know, it didn't get us kind of, it didn't get us like kind of warm. It didn't start to show us the little background. We just, we just hear her shouting out, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And some of you are hearing Mel Carter singing, right? Kiss me, kiss me when you do, I know that you will miss me, right? Others of you maybe are like the Fred Savage character, right, in Princess Bride. Any of you see that? And uh, Columbo, I know it's really Peter Falk, but he's Columbo to me in every role that he does. And, and, and he's the grandfather telling his grandson a story. And as he's talking about the, the guy and the gal, the grandson goes, wait a minute, Grandpa. Is this going to be about kissing? And when you read Song of Solomon, the simple answer is sometimes yes. But let the words mean what they say. Because it's good to know. Because let's face it, we live in a culture that has taken physical intimacy, not everybody, but in a lot of lives, they've lost their sense of value. Because physical intimacy has become cheap. It's become selfish. It's become momentary. So it's good to know that we have a God who says to us, I want to put a song in there so that you know that I have designed it beautiful in life, right? The beauty of it. Now, I want to say something. I want to make sure you know what I'm saying here up front. I want to be honest with you. This is not going to be a verse-by-verse study. It's not even going to be a paragraph-by-paragraph study. The reality is, some of the words in here that express the beautiful uh, gift of human love between a man and woman in marriage, they just would not fit the broader context of uh, why we're gathered and the audience that we have here. Some of these passages in Song of Solomon, some people in life would understand all of them. Other people in life won't understand some of them. There are others in certain points of life, there are passages in here that would make them giggle or go, God, did you see that? Did you read that? Right? We know that. We know what, what, you know, as it's expressed in here. But the point is this. Don't be afraid of letting Solomon speak about human closeness and intimacy. Because in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, God said, Let us create man in our image. And he did. Male and female, he created them. God did not create the human race to be, you know, just just one. Male and female, he created them. 
equal in his creation. I mean, together is valued by him. But, but some people miss Genesis 1.27, and they read Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 2, we read a story there where God has, it's a little more detailed, where God has created Adam. And uh, he starts to bring all the animals in front of Adam to see if there was one that could be, you know, uh, his dearest friend and, and companion. And if you don't remember Genesis 1.27 and that that's God's plan, male and female together multiply if you don't understand that, you could read Genesis 2 and be like, so wait a minute. So like, it could have been that Adam saw a squirrel and was like, you know, he could be a good friend. Lord, I think I can handle this eternity as long as I get to be with Sammy the squirrel. I, 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 I used to tell my kids stories and Sammy the squirrel was in it, right? And, and, and I know I'm being silly here, but my point is to understand what what God was doing. The human race was not hanging in the balance. If Adam said, yes, the squirrel is enough, it isn't like we would have never been here. God was not giving Adam the choice. God was displaying to Adam, none of these things are going to meet what it is that I've created in your heart and soul. I have created you for human closeness. I have created you for human value, for human intimacy. And in view of creation, it makes sense that there's a song in the Bible where God says, so don't be afraid to hug each other. Don't worry, I'm not coming after all of you, you know. And I, you know I, I'm, a, I'm a hugger, I know some of you aren't, and, and I respect that. But what God is saying is, don't be afraid of closeness. Don't be afraid of investing in each other, of caring for each other, of being vulnerable. Don't live on an island. Don't have your primary motivation, nobody will ever get close enough to me to ever hurt me. It's just not the way God meant for you to live life. I, I was uh, a few months ago uh, at... Pat Hilt's funeral. Pat Hilt, uh, Irene Hilt's part of our congregation. It was her mother-in-law. And um, Pat had three sons, I believe. And at her funeral, one of her sons, who had been a Marine in Vietnam, stood up and read this poem. And I asked him if I could have a copy of it. And he struggled to read it, and you'll certainly understand why. Because Pat Hilt wrote this poem when her son was in Vietnam as a Marine. And it's just titled, My Far Away Son. She says this, My precious boy so far away, how I long to see him today. My thoughts so often turn to him, thinking of the trouble he's in. We are sleeping so sound in the night, never a fear of some Viet Cong to fight, while my boy is there along with many others, trying to clean up things for their younger brothers. There are boys in the foxholes, and oh, how I care. I pray the dear Lord their young lives to spare. Wherever my boy is, whatever his plight, I pray the dear Lord to be with him this night. You hear her words and you can feel the ache in her heart. And as I watched her son read that poem 50 years later, you could see the ache in his heart. And when I read Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 2, May he kiss me! Sure, kissing is nice, but I don't just read that. I hear in there, caring for people can hurt. But we should do it anyway. Because people have value that car may be the car that you always wanted and you build it yourself but the greatest value to that car is it's driving you to people it's protecting people as they travel to value and to care it may hurt but it's worth it it's a song 
It's a song about human love. But it's also a, a song about human love that is in the Bible. It's a song about human love that is in the Bible. And that says something to me. Because that means it points us to the larger theme of Scripture. It points us to the song of all songs. God's love for me. God's love for us. You don't have to make every verse spiritual to find that in here. There are some commentaries where they literally remove all of any reference to the value of human relationships and human love, and they read in everything something that's spiritual. And literally one commentary, just for example, in chapter 1 and verse 12, when we read, while the king was at his table, in that commentary it says, this is a reference to Jesus being in the womb of Mary. We may get to heaven and I may find out I was wrong. But when I read, while the king was at his table, I think I'm supposed to be reading about a king who was sitting at his table. Now, but it is in Scripture. So once we look at the meaning, the story of human love and value and hurt and vulnerability and care and loyalty and faithfulness, yes, it fits in the theme of all of Scripture that there is a God who not only loves me when I love Him, he loved me way before I ever loved him. Matter of fact, Scripture says, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. That I love him only because he first loved me. And, and, and as I read the Song of Solomon, as we travel through it, we're going to be reminded it's a song. Boy, live life. Stop just enduring. Ho hum invest, reflect, live, celebrate. It's a song about human love. Look at the lives around you. They're worth hurting over. They're worth investing in. But it's a song about human love in the Bible. And the highlight of Scripture is the Gospel, that God values us to such a degree that he invested sacrificially to rescue us. And so in the spirit of Song of Solomon, centuries later, the Apostle John writes, See how great a love. You want to talk about romance. See how great a love the Father has for us that we can be called children of God. See how great a love. The God of all creation loved me so much that even though my sin deserves hell forever, He put my sin on His Son. He went to the cross, hung, was crucified to pay the price for me. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but through me. But that's the sacrificial love that the Song of Solomon points me to. When I read, May He kiss me with the kisses of His mouth, I'm thrilled about human love, but it points me to something far greater. Oh, wow, how the God of all creation has chosen to kiss me with the sacrifice of His Son. One writer says this, and I think it's a, a great reminder. He says, if you were to read C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, and you didn't know that C.S. Lewis was a Christian and used Christian symbolism and parts of the plot of the Bible, then you might never see Aslan, who dies and rises and rules, as a Christ figure. You might think he's just a lion who talks, a neat character in a nice children's tale. But those who know something about the author and his intentions see more of what he wanted his readers to see, the story beneath the story. You see, the story of Jesus opens our eyes to the subtle details of those Narnian adventures. Similarly, knowing the story of Jesus opens our eyes to the story of the Song of Solomon. 
The love celebrated here has as its source and ultimate illustration Jesus Christ. The loyalty, the beauty, the intimacy of human love depicted in this song points us to the love that undergirds all of reality and in whose presence alone all longing can be satisfied. In other words, this. No matter how wonderful the love you may taste from human beings, there is a longing that God Almighty has placed in your soul. And until you have tasted the love of God, it will never be satisfied. Because it's deeper than any human being can touch apart from Him. At your very core being. In John chapter 3, if you want to turn there in closing... In John chapter 3, as we finish, we read that verse of Scripture that maybe you've seen in your mind, kooks at football games, hanging by the goalposts, John 3.16, you know, what are they doing? They're just, they really are, they're well-intentioned, trying to get the message out, right? For God so loved the world, John 3.16 that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus wasn't crucified to make people feel bad about their sin, what He went through. All right? Shape up. Jesus wasn't crucified to be an example for us that we would sacrifice for others. That's, there's a truth there. Jesus wasn't crucified because he was misunderstood and things got out of control and he was helpless. Jesus was crucified because God loves you. That's the only reason. Jesus was crucified because he said, I lay my life down. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. And he looked at his disciples and at us, and he said, you are my friends. And he laid down his life, and in John chapter 3, later, some of the disciples of John the Baptist come up to him in verse 25, and we read, therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, a reference to Jesus, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. What does John the Baptist say? Jesus is the bridegroom, not me. It's his romance. It's his love story, not mine. And when I read Song of Solomon, I am reminded that Jesus has shouted out a love story on the cross. He loves us. He's paid the price for us. I want to ask you as we close, is it the song of your heart? Years ago, Amy Grant wrote a song, and I loved the lyrics. She said this, it's not a song till it touches your heart. It's not a song till it tears you apart. After what's left of what's right and what's wrong, till it gets through to you, it's not a song. Some of you may prefer the Bill Gaither song, right? God gave the song where they sing, so come on along. You know, right? Come on and join. It's the song of Jesus. Day after day, that song goes on. And since I found the source of music, I just can't help it. God gave the song. Do you have the song? Is it in your heart? Would you bow with me before the Lord as we close? And I just want to, you know, I, I, if you're comfortable closing your eyes, bowing your head, my point is, don't worry about anybody else around you. Don't worry about what they're thinking or what they're, you know, what they need to hear. This is me and God, right? But I want to ask you in your own heart, is it the song of your heart? Have you let the lyrics get through? Because God wants them to. The lyrics of the gospel, 
that you're a sinner and you're separated from God because of your sin. And you will never be able to pay for it. You just can't. Scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We, we just can't pay for it. But the song, the love story is that God says, I already paid for it. I put all your sin on my son, Jesus. I love you. Maybe right where you sit in your own heart before God, not out loud to me. Lord God, I confess my sin. I believe this love story. I believe today where I sit, Maple Shade, New Jersey, in February of 2017, I believe that the God of all creation loves me. And I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sin. And today I ask you to forgive me. Save me. Make me your child. Give me the gift of your love as your child forever. Would you pray that to him? Right where you sit. Maybe you're here today and you've prayed that before. But you would be honest, you've lost the song. I don't mean you've lost God's love because he still loves you. I mean you've lost hearing it. You've lost tasting it. If you're honest, your ears are hearing you grumble a lot. They're hearing you criticize a lot. They're hearing you complain and get angry a lot. There's a song that continues to be played. It's the song of Jesus. It's the song the angels are singing that life is here for you today to taste it, to touch it, to smell it, to invest in it, to know the love of God and to show that love to others. Maybe today is a day for you to just say, Lord, thank you. Let me, let me hear the music again. Make it louder. Let me start to tap my foot. Turn it into a dance. Father in heaven, I thank you for the scripture that you've given us and for the reminder that you are a creative God who has not given us life that is an eternal, boring chant. You have given us Life that is eternal and filled with variety and newness, creativity. Every bit of it saturated with the fact that the God of creation loves us. Lord, thank you. I don't deserve it, but I'm going to sing it till the day that I die and forever. In your name I pray. Amen.